If you find the gangster drama Casino and its lead hero, Sam Ace Rothstein, too crazy and fantastical to be true, then brace yourself. The real story is even tougher. You make me pop your f***ing eye out of your head to protect that piece of s***, Charlie M! Sam Ace Rothstein, played by Robert De Niro, was originally based on well-known player Frank Lefty Rosenthal. Nikki Santora was based on Anthony Ant Spilatro. Ginger McKenna is based on Jerry McGee, Rosenthal's wife. Philip Green is based on Alan Glick, who ran Argent Corporation. The Tangier Casino in the film is a fictional name for the Stardust Casino. The interior scenes were filmed inside the Riviera Casino Hotel, and the exteriors were shot in front of the Westgate Hotel. Rothstein only has one casino in the film. In reality, though, Lefty Rosenthal ran four at the same time. Lefty earned his nickname during a trial when he answered, I don't know, 37 times in a row to any of the prosecutor's questions, including, are you left or right-handed? In his native Chicago, the Jewish-born teenager was extremely proficient at gambling, having been addicted to it since early childhood, attending horse races with his father at the city's racetrack. His father had his own horses, and Rosenthal Sr. was completely obsessed with horse racing. But his young and zealous son was far more ambitious and versatile, so he quickly outgrew his father's business and started gambling big time. By the time he reached adulthood, Frank Rosenthal was already deeply involved in an underground gambling empire, where he became famous for his inborn talent. The prototype, like the character of De Niro, had remarkable mathematical skills, as well as a gigantic hard work. Every day, read a lot of core newspapers and magazines, analyzing thousands of combinations. In the 1950s, he became acquainted with Chicago gangsters, connections with whom helped him open an illegal bookmaker's office. Rosenthal's company was located in the Chicago suburb of Cicero. The office operated under the cover of the shell firm Cicero Home Improvement. Rosenthal's company accepted illegal sports betting and organized match-fixing activities. After Rosenthal was found to be involved in rigged sporting events, he was forced to move the business to Miami to avoid unnecessary police attention. By 1961, Rosenthal had gained fame as one of the most successful bookmakers and gamblers in the United States. In Miami, he was seen more than once in the company of famous gangsters such as Jackie Chiron and Fiore Buccieri. Rosenthal's activities could not go unnoticed by U.S. authorities, And one day, he received a subpoena for arranging match-fixing. But his guilt could not be proven. Despite frequent arrests for involvement in illegal gambling and bookmaking, Rosenthal was convicted only once, after being found guilty in 1963 on charges of bribing a New York University basketball player. Here's how it worked. Gangsters would make contracts with representatives of sports clubs that they would influence the team's results. And Rosenthal, using insider information, would pick the best bets. Frank never lied to his bosses. He was a professional and knew what, when, and to whom to say it. At a time when many of Rosenthal's colleagues were doing time in prison or dying unnatural deaths, he had a code of honor that helped him progress from Chicago to Miami and then to Las Vegas. In the 1960s in Miami, Rosenthal was also listed as a suspect in office and car bombing cases. The FBI opened an open-ended case against him, the records of which were 300 pages long. To avoid police harassment, Rosenthal moved to Las Vegas in 1968. As soon as he arrived in Las Vegas and checked into the Tropicana Hotel, undercover policemen burst into his room, handcuffed him, and took him to the office for questioning. In the interrogation room, he asked for the handcuffs to be loosened slightly, to which the officers tightened them even harder. When the head detective entered the room, he told Rosenthal, You and your friends from Chicago are not very welcome in our city. I want you out of here on the first plane and never come back. Thus began the Las Vegas chapter of Rosenthal's biography. He never left the city, however. By that time, Lefty was working at the legendary Stardust Casino. He started out as a simple croupier. It was hard, exhausting work. An eight-hour shift should be completely on their feet. The pay at the time was $1.75 per shift. He had to relieve the stress of his job by smoking. You rarely saw Rosenthal without cigarettes. However, Rosenthal continued to work hard and soon became a casino manager. As he continued to climb the ladder, he became the first manager of four casinos in Las Vegas history. In addition, he also managed three hotels. According to U.S. intelligence agencies, 
Rosenthal did not achieve this success without the help of good old friends from the Chicago gangs, who laundered huge amounts of money through the casinos under Rosenthal's control. The casinos Rosenthal ran were bought by a California businessman, Alan Glick, with money he borrowed from the gangsters. In return, the gangsters demanded that their men, Rosenthal among them, be appointed to management positions in these casinos. It is said that the gangsters called Rosenthal crazy among themselves. Jane Morrison, a federal court reporter, had this to say about Rosenthal. The few times I met Rosenthal, he looked at me like I was a worm he wanted to squash. And the only reason he wouldn't do it was to avoid getting the bottom of his shoe dirty. But one cannot ignore Rosenthal's merits as a manager. He brought in a lot of innovations. For example, thanks to him, the casino was able to bet on sporting events. Thanks to this, the Stardust Casino became one of the largest bookmakers in the world. Rosenthal also decided that it would be better to have female croupiers working in the casino, despite the fact that the profession of croupier had previously been considered a man's business. Thanks to this innovation, the Stardust Casino's profits doubled. In his views, Rosenthal was a perfectionist. The movie Casino reflects a real situation from Rosenthal's biography. He believed that every cupcake should have the same amount of raisins, no more and no less. The chef of the casino tried to argue about it and was fired. In addition, in the Lido of Paris, the most popular Lido in Las Vegas, all the girls were selected strictly according to their height, and their casting was supervised personally by Rosenthal. One more feature of the Rosenthal Casino was the Frank Rosenthal Show, broadcast from the Stardust Casino. The talk show with pop, sports, and gambling stars was not only an interesting TV show, but also a good promotion for the casino, especially when people like Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope were guests. And here is another of his marketing tricks, about which Lefty liked to tell journalists. When I worked in a casino, we used a bait like this. On a huge neon billboard that cost several hundred thousand dollars, we used to advertise a breakfast that cost only 49 cents. It included two eggs, bacon, gravy, ham, toast, coffee. No driver could drive past our casino without noticing this billboard. We did everything we could to lure customers into our casino to try to play and, yes, get their breakfast for 49 cents. And here's an example of how that worked. One day, a family came to Las Vegas for a little vacation. They encroached on our breakfast sign for 49 cents. While the family ate, the father decided to play a little blackjack. In half an hour, he lost $18,000. After that, the man, a father of two, was forced to ask the casino administrator for a refund for at least a trip home to Arizona. He had trivially no money left for fuel. He and his family wanted to save for breakfast, and they ended up losing all their savings in half an hour. But our casino did give this family money for the trip. It's a disturbing story, but it happens every day in Las Vegas. The Rosenthal Casino fought ruthlessly against cheaters. Those who cheated had their hands broken, and the movie Casino depicts one of those cases. Over time, cheaters in the casinos under Rosenthal's control became extinct. Another of Rosenthal's innovations was the beauties, who appeared in places where the client was about to leave the game with serious winnings. They were supposed to help the successful player not to leave, and the casino would do its job. The Kansas, St. Louis, and Milwaukee gangsters who laundered money through Rosenthal had assigned Anthony Spilatro to keep an eye on Lefty. Who is Anthony Spilatro? Anthony John Spilatro was born on May 19, 1938, in a rough neighborhood in Chicago. Anthony Spilotro was one of six children, all boys. His parents, Pasquale and Antoinette Spilotro, were Italian immigrants and owned Patsy's Restaurant. It was the family business that first introduced young Anthony to organized crime. Patsy's was a common gangster hangout, and meetings between gangs were often held in the parking lot of the restaurant. Spilotro and his brothers often engaged in criminal activities together, including shoplifting and purse snatching. In 1954, his father died suddenly, leaving his mother to raise her six sons. He dropped out of high school that same year and spent most of his time involved in small crimes. At age 16, he earned his first arrest for trying to steal a shirt. However, his small-time activities were no longer enough, and soon he had his eye on Chicago's largest crime family. He also had his eye on Nancy Stewart, a small local waitress who worked in the local mob, and married her in 1960. By 1962, Spilatro had befriended several influential members of the Chicago underworld, including Vincent Incero, Joseph Lombardo, and mob boss Joseph Ippa. That same year, Spilotro joined Sam DeStefano's crew. DeStefano was considered too unpredictable and undisciplined to be considered a real leader, but his violent and sadistic nature was much welcomed by the bosses as a way to spread fear and terror. Even law enforcement authorities looked upon him with apprehension. 
Under De Stefano's leadership, Spilotro finally got the contract to kill Billy McCarthy and Jimmy Moralia, two 24-year-old thieves known as the M&M Boys. Spilotro tortured the men before killing them. In a notorious interrogation technique to force McCarthy to reveal Moralia's whereabouts, Spilotro and his goons held McCarthy's head in a vice until the victim's eye popped out. Their bodies were found by authorities in the trunk of a car on Chicago's south side. The brutal murders made Spilotro's reputation among local mobsters and earned him made guy status in 1963. But Spilotro's situation also attracted the attention of local law enforcement, as well as the media, who began referring to Spilotro as an ant, citing his height of 62 inches. Spilotro continued to gain notoriety throughout the syndicate as a prepper and performer, and by 1971, Spilotro had been engaged by Ayupa to replace Marshal Caifano as a mob representative in Las Vegas. There is one point to be made clear here. Today, Las Vegas is in the hands of gambling corporations, whereas in Rosenthal's time, Vegas was at the mercy of gangster syndicates headed by Frank Balistrieri, a Milwaukee mob boss, and Nick Savella, the boss of Kansas City. They invested more than $127 million in the acquisition and renovation of the casino and assigned the job to San Diego developer Alan Glick. For some time, Glick had been in charge of the casino, but he did not realize he was dealing with the mafia. He also had no idea that he would be commanded by one of his employees. But when he met him, Rosenthal said, It's time for you to be clear about what's going on here, where I came from, and where you are supposed to be. I was not put in this position for your benefit, but for the benefit of others. I don't have to put up with any of the nonsense you talk, and I won't listen to anything you say, because you're not the boss of me. And when I say you have no choice but to obey me, I don't just mean running the casino, I mean your health as well. If you interfere with any casino operations or prevent me from doing what needs to be done, I guarantee you that you will not leave this corporation alive. Frank Rosenthal was a dandy in life. For example, he was known to have more than 200 pairs of pants in his closet, and all his clothes consisted exclusively of tailored items. As a casino boss, Lefty was a perfectionist who did not tolerate the slightest flaw in customer service. One day when Rosenthal was walking through Stardust and saw a cigarette butt on the floor, he picked it up and then fired the man in charge of keeping that section of the hall clean. Frank generally conducted business by mafia rules. He did not like to be second best and undermine the confidence of his men. His grip on casino management was iron, and his response to employee misconduct was ruthless. Yes, Frank Rosenthal was not a man you would want to meet a second time, but he was a number genius and a demanding perfectionist in business. He had been moving up the social ladder for a long time, and his future looked pretty bright. But one thing happened that had a great effect on his life. He fell in love. If you're as intrigued as we are by the blurred lines between fiction and reality in the mob world, then you won't want to miss our full video on the Sopranos actors turned criminals in real life. Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay wise and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching.